Before we start, just a few notices from me about potential alternate versions of timelines which I've recently stumbled across. First, the Wikipedia page for Ptolemy Caraunus states an alternate interpretation of the events of the Argos, which is that Seleucus was sacrificing there, rather than re being regaled with tales of olden days. Second, the Encyclopaedia Britannica explicitly states that Antiochus I was made co-king because nomads threatened the eastern portions of the Seleucid Empire. Whether this is true or not, I do not know. As we saw in episode 21, there are always several versions of most events in this period. However, even if it is true, the general point that I made would still stand that Seleucus delegated this area to his son. This delegation allowed Seleucus to focus on the west, and gave Antiochus some political and military training. So anyway, that's two pseudo-corrections if you like. With that, on with the show. Hello everyone, and welcome to After Alexander, episode 23, When All Men Doubt You. So, we finally pick up the main narrative again. The title for this episode is taken from the 1895 poem If, written by Rudyard Kipling to his son John Kipling. I've chosen this because, as we'll see, Antiochus I is not going to experience a smooth ride from 281 onwards. I guess first of all, we should head back over to Macedon and pick up Ptolemy the Thunderbolt's story near Lysimachia. Now, to fully understand the level of chaos that would have accompanied the assassination of Seleucus I, we need to understand the sheer distance between him and his son over in the eastern half of the empire. After Seleucus' death, messengers would have had to fly like the wind across the empire to send word of the incident to Antiochus, who would then make his way over. As you can perhaps imagine, this whole debacle wouldn't have been the shortest of journeys. So, for all that time, there was functionally no one leading the situation over in Europe. Accordingly, the army stationed in Lysimachia was confused and without a leader. Handily enough for them, it was at this point that Ptolemy the Thunderbolt appeared in the army camps, wearing the royal diadem, having just murdered Seleucus. Caraunus was acclaimed by the army, and from the phrasing of Bevan's 1902 book, you get the sense that the army was relieved someone was taking charge and that there was a clear path forward again. The acclaiming of Caranus, however, also isolated the remaining Seleucid possessions in Europe from the mainland, if you will, to the east, at one swift blow. Caranus' ambition was to take charge of the lands his former protector Seleucus had just seized control of. However, he was initially blocked in this ambition by Lysimachus' widow Arsinoe, who, who was his own half-sister and the full sister of the new pharaoh Ptolemy II in the south. Arsinoe was determined to place her son on the throne of his father Lysimachus. At this point I should double back and address the fact that there were, in fact, children of Arsinoe II. She had three sons by Lysimachus. Ptolemy, born 299-298 BCE, Lysimachus, born 297-296, and Philip, born 294. I assume that the son she was trying to put on the throne refers to Ptolemy, who would probably have been about 17 or 18 at the time. Arsinoe II was reckoned to be a fierce and formidable opponent by Edwin R. Bevan, and she didn't lack ambition. In fact, her Wikipedia page cites her as having had Agathocles poisoned, which I believe is part of the broader execution narrative rather than the new fact. However, for all her cunning, the Thunderbolt is reckoned by Bevan to have equalled the cunning and guile of Arsinoe. He married her, which I think Bevan sees as the first step towards neutralising her political ambitions. This marriage in itself also had some political aspect, as both people involved claimed the throne of Macedon, Thrace and Anatolia, 
Ptolemy the Thunderbolt was eventually, as the royal diadem would suggest, installed on the throne of Macedon. However, his marriage to Arsinoe II fragmented as his power grew, and eventually a conspiracy formed with Arsinoe II and her sons to remove the Thunderbolt from power. He accordingly reacted savagely, as you might expect, and murdered Lysimachus and Philip, Arsinoe's two younger sons. The eldest, Ptolemy, managed to escape. I'm going to refer to this son of Arsinoe II as Ptolemy of Telmessus to distinguish him from his uncle Ptolemy II, half-uncle Ptolemy the Thunderbolt, and maternal grandfather Ptolemy I, as I think he might come up again in our narrative. Trust me, I promise it's just as awkward for me to keep track of all these Ptolemies as it is for you. With as many as there are going round, we might even have to come up with a collective noun for them. An intrigue of Ptolemies, perhaps. Suggestions to the show's email address welcome. But back to Arsinoe. She sought sanctuary in Samothrace, and eventually made her way to Egypt, where she would end up marrying her full brother Ptolemy II. But that's for a later days. We will get into it eventually. On a broader sense, Caraunus was in a difficult position after the murder of Seleucus. The whole of the Greek world would have been shocked by the deed, and plenty of rulers would have found a reason to declare war on him. Any threat from Egypt was admittedly neutralised by Caraunus' assurance that he sought no claim to his half-brother's throne. But his claim to kingship in Macedon would have pushed the buttons of both Antigonus II and Pyrrhus, while Antiochus was compelled to make war on the Thunderbolt to avenge the death of his father. The threat Caraunus faced from the Antigonids is especially plausible when you remember that the Antigonids had a history with the Seleucids. After all, Antigonus II is the brother-in-law of Antiochus. Out of these two men, Antigonus II was closer to Caraunus and struck first. He marched north towards Macedon when he heard of the death of Seleucus, deciding that now was his chance to take back the domains of his father Demetrius. However, Ptolemy the Thunderbolt defeated him, and was, for the moment, victorious in Macedon. Antigonus II was duly forced to withdraw back to his holdings in central Greece. So, with that out of the way, let's pivot over to Antiochus for a bit, as we haven't really focused on him much so far this episode. Antiochus faced quite a challenge as he headed west. A revolt broke out in Syria almost immediately following the death of his father, which prevented him from crossing the Taurus Mountains and confronting Caraunus as he would perhaps like to have done. This revolt seems to have been most likely started, or at least prompted, by Egypt. Now, frustratingly enough, I cannot seem to find out any detail about the revolt, other than it must have been put down, as the region doesn't appear to change hands. As both Antiochus and Caraunus were threatened elsewhere, Antiochus would eventually be forced to make peace with him, essentially ceding Macedon and Thrace to Caraunus. The idea seems to have been that Seleucid influence would extend up to Anatolia, but no further west. For the moment at least, Caraunus was safe. We should probably switch over to talk about Anatolia at this point. Evidence suggests that, in the crisis following the death of Seleucus, many in Anatolia declared for Antiochus. Initially, at least, Lieutenants such as Philetaerus were relied upon to keep Anatolia in check, rather than with direct force of arms. Bearing all of that in mind, we need to talk about three states which are going to either emerge or rise in this same time period, namely Bithynia, Pontus, and Pergamon. So, first of all, the Bithynians. Bithynia appears to have had some form of independence ever since the time of the conquest of Alexander the Great, several decades before now. Two rulers of Bithynia, called Bas and Zipoites, successfully walked the tightrope and maintained their independence throughout the early Hellenistic period. Zipoites I, by the way, ascended to power in 326 BCE, and so has been in power for some decades by this point. At around about this same time, in 281, an army under the command of Hermogenes, a subordinate of Antiochus's lieutenant Patrocles, was trying to suppress a revolt that had been going on against the rule of the Seleucid dynasty in Anatolia. 
During his intimidation of the city of Heraclea, the Bithynians attacked his force and destroyed it. The disaster was bad enough that Antiochus, who had previously relied on subordinates in the region, crossed over the Taurus Mountains with Stratonike with the dual aim of pacifying the region and stamping his supremacy on it. Initially, he seems to have dealt with the situation ably. The death of Sapoites by this point and the succession of the Philicidal Nicomedes I presented an opportunity to intervene and restore Seleucid supremacy. This was because Nicomedes' younger brother Zipoites, I know another one, had escaped the murderous attempts of Nicomedes and wanted to make himself ruler of part of their father's domain. However, Nicomedes had his father's force of will. He courageously chose to ally with Heraclea, the rebellious city which had, before, only yielded in the face of Hermogenes' army appearing outside their gates. This alliance with Heraclea effectively pitted him against Antiochus. Heraclea duly agreed to the alliance, and Nicomedes became the head of an anti-Seleucid coalition in Anatolia, quietly giving away his brother's planned kingdom to the city in the process. Through this giveaway, Heraclea ultimately ended up fighting against this same brother, which ended with Heraclea gaining the territory, and the younger Zipoites ending up ruling a part of Bithynia for himself. At this point, Heraclea opportunistically began buying back all its former territory in Anatolia in this moment of Seleucid weakness. One of these cities, Amastris, was ruled by Eumenes, the nephew of the eunuch Philetaerus we mentioned just now, who was nominally, nominally at least a loyal adherent of the Seleucids. Eumenes, however, refused to sell, and eventually turned the region over to Ario Barzanes of Pontus instead, who we'll mention in now in a moment. So, let's turn our lens over to them for a bit before picking up our main narrative again at the end of the episode. So, Pontus. This region had originally been part of the satrapy of Cappadocia under the Achaemenid Persian Empire. The first known member of its dynasty was Mithridates of Chios, named for the Greek city which he ruled over. His son Ario Barzanes II, the satrap of Phrygia, would become an ally of Athens and revolt against the Persian emperor Artaxerxes II, but was betrayed by his son, Mithridates. This Mithridates would survive the sweeping conquest of Alexander, but became a vassal of Antigonus I during this man's ascendancy. Despite this vassal status, he would be assassinated on the orders of Antigonus in 302, who suspected that he might be in cahoots with his long-term rival Cassander. Antigonus also planned to kill Mithridates' son, Mithridates III of Chios, but Demetrius warned him and he managed to get away with a grand total of six horsemen. He ended up arriving in Amasya and ruled from 302 to 266 BCE. Even during the life of Seleucus I, he'd been a rival, but in either 281 or 280, he declared himself to be a full-on king as well. And it was his son, Ario Barzanes, who would, through Eumenes, gain the kingdom's first Black Sea port, Amastris, in 279. After this brief description, this is where I'm going to leave the story of Pontus, as they're going to get involved in the, to the topic for next week's episode. Finally, let's quickly discuss Pergamon. Lysimachus had taken control of Pergamon in 301 BCE as part of his takeover of Anatolia following the collapse of Antigonid fortunes. He had sent a second-in-command called Philetaerus, remember that name from just then, to enlarge the town. And it was this same Philetaerus who was one of the men who later encouraged Seleucus to invade the region and became a turncoat in 282, turning over the fortress and its treasury to the Seleucids. He would also be the one to persuade Caraunus to hand over the body of Seleucus, and the one to cremate it, ultimately sending Antiochus the ashes, and they would eventually be buried in Seleucia Pieria. However, with the effective fragmenting of Lysimachus's rule and Seleucid authority in Anatolia following the death of Seleucus I, Philetaerus managed to become an essentially independent ruler in Pergamon from 281 onwards, 
despite nominal allegiance to Antiochus. To round out our picture, I suppose I should also briefly mention Cappadocia, another sovereign entity which is going to crop up in the decades ahead. When Alexander conquered the Persians, a man called Ariarathes managed to make himself king of Cappadocia through some unknown means, whereas previously he'd been a satrap or governor. As we saw in our first few episodes way back at the beginning of the series, Perdiccas sent a military expedition into Cappadocia and used the success of this to declare Alexander IV as a co-king under his domination. Cappadocia was essentially peaceful until Alexander died. In the partitions of Tripyridaceus following the downfall of Perdiccas, the wily pro perdiccas general called Eumenes had been awarded the region and managed to subdue it, but the subsequent scuffling of the Diadochoi meant that Ariarathes' adoptive son, Ariarathes II, managed to regain his regal position. From then on, a line of Cappadocian kings would rule. So, with that quick summary done, let's return back to our narrative and Antiochus in Anatolia. Antiochus promptly took the fight against this growing northern league who were aligned against him. His fleets were however blocked by the league's ships when they appeared in the Bosphorus, with no decisive results either way. Added to that, the difference in opinion meant that Antigonus II, the ally of Antiochus we mentioned just now, briefly fought against his sister's husband. After a good deal of fighting, of which the records are unfortunately lost, Antigonus made peace and abandoned the fight. That's where I'll leave the story of the League for now, in the middle of a battle against Antiochus I for rule, as the actions that come immediately after this point are going to tie in with the topic for next week's episode. So, what to make of all of this? Well, Bevan ascribes the problems in Asia Minor broadly down to the fact that Anatolia was not one unit, there weren't one overarching Anatolian people you could think of, for example. The kingdom of Lydia, in the west of Anatolia, might eventually have done so, but it was destroyed by the Persians during the reign of Cyrus the Great. That said, even the Persians would struggle to keep hold of the region. Ultimately, Antiochus was unable to subdue Bithynia or Cappadocia. This essentially demonstrates that Seleucid control of Anatolia, Macedon and Thrace is going to decline following Seleucus' death, as we just saw with the effective cessation of Macedon and Thrace. This obviously doesn't mean that the Seleucids are gone from the region of Anatolia. Far from it, in fact, as we'll see with future rulers. However, everything I've said this week does demonstrate that Seleucid dominion in Anatolia was not going to be as uncontested or as easy as it might have been when Seleucus I got hold of it. Bevan also notes that Anatolia always fascinated the Seleucids in a way that Iran did not, for two connected reasons. It was the road back to the Greek homeland from before the days of the Persian conquests, as well as being full of such prestigious names such as the Ionians and Ilium, which is the mythical site of Troy. Taken together, Anatolia would have been culturally important as a region to the Seleucids. Bevan goes into great detail about Anatolia in the chapter following the death of Seleucus, and, while it is definitely interesting, it would be too long of a discussion for this episode. So, perhaps someday, I might come back to Anatolia in the form of a bonus episode. The collapse of Seleucid fortunes in the West wasn't an immediate process. For example, regions in Europe would still mint coins with the face of Antiochus for a time, as they had done for his father. These coins were struck with the anchor, a symbol of Macedonian kingship and a sign that some believed the Seleucids were now the rulers of Macedon. This implies that even the usurpation of Macedon by Caraunus was gradual, with pockets of Seleucid resistance holding out here and there. Bevan argues that the Empire of Alexander, and the Empire that Seleucus had now consolidated, was never going to stay together in one piece, because it never had a vitality or a natural unity. From his point of view, the Seleucid Empire was only held together by the personality of its founder, Seleucus I. 
as he himself says, quote, Its history from the moment it misses its founder's force is one of decline. It was a sick man from its birth. Its construction occupied the few glorious years of Seleucus Nicator, its dissolution the succeeding two and a quarter centuries. End quote. He saw the geographic boundaries of the Taurus and the Zagros Mountains, which separate Anatolia, the Levant and Iran into three pieces, as creating separate battlegrounds and regions to defend. And to his mind, these mountain ranges were the natural weak spots of the Seleucid domain. Whether or not you agree with this viewpoint, Antiochus was facing far bigger problems than those his father had dealt with. As we've seen over this week's episode, the death of Seleucus and the power vacuum that followed meant that Anatolia was beginning to crumble, creating a tangled mess of nominal loyalties, independent kingdoms, and competing claims, which anyone would struggle to reassert unity over. Next time, the situation gets more complicated for everyone yet again as we contend with a new group moving into the Hellenistic world from pastures old, the Celts. Until then, thank you all for listening. Feel free to get in touch with the show's email address for any questions or comments. And until next time, have a great week, everyone.